Well, actually, um, before we started this um, this trial, we used a uh, whole recording uh, at, at our hospital uh, to detect the atrial fibrillation in all uh, patients with ischemic stroke and, and TIA. And whole recording has been recognized, a gold standard for decades in atrial fibrillation detection, but it's also quite time consuming. We use about one hour for each 24 hours of whole recording uh, in manual analyzing. And we thought that uh, maybe we can switch and use uh, the new um, external loop recorders instead. They hold several advantages. Uh, the, the loop recorder we studied, they can, uh, they're able to monitor for up to 32 days and they are more comfortable to wear and they have a software that can automatically detect atrial fibrillation. So, so it would be more comfortable and we would spare a lot of time if we could switch over and to use an ELR. But we, uh, we also um, saw that there were very few studies in the area comparing ELR and Holder. And uh, so we didn't really know the sensitivity and specificity uh, in doing the switch. So that, that's why we started uh, to do um, the simultaneous recordings um, to uh, evaluate the ELR. We uh, collected the data um, from uh, the Department of Neurology in our hospital. So we consecutively in included the patients with an ischemic stroke or TAA in a prospective uh, cohort study, uh, observational study. And uh, our criteria were the patient had to be 60 years old or above, and they should have had an ischemic stroke or TAA within the last week and they should not be known with atrial fibrillation and have no atrial fibrillation on a surface uh, ECD. First, we looked at um, uh, how many atrial fibrillation patients were diagnosed on whole recording uh, and how many patients were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation on the ELR recording. And we went through all the recordings from the, a total of 1,412 patients that we had included with the simultaneous recordings. Um, well, we were quite surprised um, that the ELR uh, found so many patients with atrial fibrillation compared to whole recording. At whole recording, we uh, detected 38 patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, and uh, the ELR automatically categorized 219 patients with atrial fibrillation. So that's 2.7% um, compared to 15.5%. But we went through all the recordings um, from the ELR uh, with atrial fibrillation, and we could sort out 74% of all the patients uh, as having sinus rhythm with uh, ex uh, just extra beats um, or, or just noise. But 57 of the patients did fulfill the criteria of atrial fibrillation, which were um, a, a rhythm without uh, detectable P waves and, and more than 30 seconds. So they, so 57 they had that, and that's 4%. Um, well, still the sensitivity was just around 84%. The specificity was 98, but the positive predictive value was uh, still quite low at 56%. Um, percent. And uh, the devices agreed in atrial fibrillation in 32 patients, but actually the ELR missed six patients with atrial fibrillation detected on whole recording, and they still disagreed in 25 patients. And we could go through all the, the recordings again with the simultaneous recording, and, and um, they had sinus rhythm on whole recording, but fulfilled the criteria of atrial fibrillation on the ELR recording. But, but since we had defined our whole recording as gold standard, uh, they were all, uh, all the 25 were also false positives. So we ended up um, saying that, uh, that well, uh, actually the, the ELR uh, found uh, only one uh, correct atrial fibrillation for uh, each five uh, uncorrectly identified uh, atrial fibrillation compared to whole recording. For us, it was um, important uh, to um, uh, to do the simultaneous recordings because it's a very huge study uh, we made. Uh, we compared uh, to the literature and and uh, that a few studies and um, the studies we found were um, have very uh, have quite uh, small uh, cohorts. Um, so this is um, yeah this is uh, the biggest uh, uh, that's uh, published uh, uh, until now, um, <clears throat> and I think it's very important because there are so many devices at the market now and that they are not very uh, good. I validated uh, with sensitivity and specificity, um, but um, so, so I think it's very important that that um, just to say that the ELI is not very suitable, it's not uh, suitable for AF detection in stroke and TIA patients, and we should look very meticulous in other devices um, because it's it's not enough that they can just um, detect a lot of atrial fibrillation and they can detect for a month. Um, 
if it's not uh, correctly detected. Because the problem is that if you catch all this uh, non-atrial fibrillation and you categorize this as atrial fibrillation, you give the patient oral anticoagulation therapy and um, then you induce an enhanced feeding risk in the patients. Yeah, and, um, and it's not for benefit to the patient if they don't have atrial fibrillation. I think that the that this study um, will um, hopefully <laughs> uh, it will uh, uh, make uh, make uh, other uh, researchers um, do a better, a better meticulous testing of uh, new devices before they're introduced and marketed, and um, also make make uh, medical doctors in the clinic uh, aware that they have to check. Uh, uh, how well is this uh, tested? Is it good enough uh, before we're just uh, switching over to a new device instead of uh, recognized uh, devices like cooler recordings?